What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and today we're going to be talking about some new spoilers coming out of Warhammer Community about the 10th edition data sheets. We finally have some data sheets to work with and some examples of new stratagems and abilities that they will be using in 10th edition, and this is so exciting. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about two separate articles that were written on Warhammer Community on the 3rd and 4th of April. The first one talks about the anatomy of the new data sheet, and we get a little bit of a preview of the current Intercessor Squad. This one looks basically very similar to the 9th edition version of the Intercessor Squad. It has the same movement, toughness, saving characteristics, as well as wounds. Its leadership is mathematically around equivalent, but leadership has been reversed. Just like weapon skill, ballistic skill, and saving throws, leadership is now incentivized to have lower numbers. You have to roll higher than your leadership value to pass tests rather than below it, so they're just going to flip the math basically, as well as the new objective control statistic. Now, there have been a lot of questions about objective control and exactly what it means, and the article does specify. When you are determining who has control of an objective, you count up the total objective control of all models within the objective range. So if you're standing within three inches of the 40 millimeter objective, assuming that objectives have the same range and work the same way as they do in ninth edition, if you have five models that have OC2, you're going to have a objective control of 10, whereas if your opponent has nine models, models with OC1, they're going to have an objective control of 9. Five models with extra OC are going to steal that objective away. Now, they've also specified that a lot of models that are currently troops will likely have higher OC values. They aren't going to have battlefield roles anymore, so they aren't going to be getting special objective holding abilities from their detachment rules because battlefield roles have been removed. We are now just using the rule of three, so you can take three units of each data sheet, regardless of what battlefield role they filled in the previous version of the game. And they also mentioned that vehicles and monsters will also have much higher OC values. So one or two infantry models will be unlikely to steal objectives from them, but it's likely that a large number of high OC models will be able to run in and grab them. Now, the interesting question that I still have is how the potentially rumored OC zero units will work. We did talk about that in the previous video where I talked about some Tyranid spoilers, and there is a rumored unit called Paragons that are an OC of zero. Now, obviously, grain of salt on that stuff. We don't know if that's entirely true, but the question is whether or not units that have potentially do have that low objective control characteristic will be able to hold objectives on their own. Now, as we've seen previously, attacks and attack skill, weapon skill or ballistic skill is being moved to each individual weapon profile. This gives the, um, the opportunity to have different ballistic skill or weapon skill values for different weapons. So if we have something like a regular melee weapon, a chain sword, for example, and on top of that, also a power fist, we can just, instead of giving the power fist minus one to hit using the unit's core weapon skill, we can just give it a lower weapon skill to begin with, which just make things a lot easier. It's also going to make things a lot easier to reference, and you can just track down the line, and you don't have to look back up to the unit's core stat block and then back down to the weapon when determining what you need to roll on each step of your attack sequence. Now, they have clarified as well that the attack sequence is remaining largely unchanged. You're going to roll a number of dice equal to your attacks. You're going to try to roll on whatever your attack skill is, whether that's weapon skill for melee attacks or ballistic skill for ranged attacks. Then you're going to roll strength versus your opponent's toughness. If your strength is equal to their toughness, you'll need a 4+. plus. If it's higher, you'll need a 3, and if it's lower, you'll need a 5. Although, as has been previewed in the past, a lot of the defensive characteristics of units are changing, and we will see that made manifest in the next article that we'll talk about. Now, now, another interesting thing about weapon profiles is that a lot of weapon types have also been removed. We're no longer going to see weapons being a, you know, rapid fire two weapon as their weapon type. Instead, they're just going to have a number of attacks and have the rapid fire special weapon attribute. Now, exactly what a lot of those do are still up in the air, but we do have a couple previews of some really important ones. And to take a look at that, we'll look at the next article, which is talking about the data sheet of the new Space Marine Terminators. So, so these guys are the brand new shiny kit of enormous Terminators. They look about a head taller than the current sculpt of Terminators, which is certainly showing its age. And uh, oh man, do they look good both in the model and on the tabletop. We do have a quick sneak peek at the entirety of their data sheet here. They're coming in at move five, toughness five, going up a point of toughness from their previous incarnation. And again, those defensive profiles are all going to be increasing to make the game less lethal. So things are going to be much harder to kill. They retain their characteristic 2 plus armor save, 
three wounds, solid leadership, but only have an objective control value of one. So unlike those intercessors, they're going to have objectives stolen from them by normal, regular infantry a lot more often. These guys are here to kill models off of objectives, not necessarily just to hold territory. We can also see a couple of changes to their weapon profiles. The assault cannon has the devastating wounds characteristic, and we don't know what that means currently, but it has dropped an AP value. It still has six attacks and hits on threes, which may mean that it no longer suffers a heavy penalty since uh, you know there are no heavy weapons in the game so it looks like moving and shooting with your assault cannon will no longer cost you minus one to hit they are still strength six but at an AP of zero however that devastating wounds may have an impact in the past assault cannons have had the rending ability which gives them a high AP value on wound rolls of six and it may be that that devastating wounds represents that the cyclone missile launcher gives us a peek at the variable payload weapons and I love how they've demarcated them they're just listed under a single line in the spreadsheet on the data sheet, but they have a little pip next to them that refers to the bottom of the data sheet and says that you select only one profile to make attacks with. That just saves a ton of space from the current version of these variable payload weapons. These guys can either fire frag missiles, which is a 2d6 strength for AP0 attack, basically the same as it currently is with blast, or a crack missile, which is strength 9, a two-shot weapon at AP2 d6 damage. So we have seen that the missile launchers are going to be increasing in strength characteristic as well, but with that increased of toughness, it's actually going to be uh, not quite as exciting. Even shooting at an enemy Terminator squad, despite the fact that they have that plus one strength, they are still going to be winning them on threes, thanks to that big toughness of five now. We also see some new characteristics in both the Stormbolter and Heavy Flamer. The actual core characteristics of these hasn't changed, but the Heavy Flamer has gotten the Ignore Cover attribute, which Flamers back in the day used to have. Interestingly, it has a ballistic skill of not applicable, so it may be that Torrent just means it hits automatically and you don't need the ballistic skill characteristic. The Stormbolter has the new Rapid Flamer, fire characteristic. Now, in practice, the Stormbolter itself is going to work basically the same as the previous incarnation, where within 12 inches, it's going to fire four times, but within 24, it's going to fire only two. It doesn't look like these guys will get Bolter Discipline, although that may be a detachment ability, so they will not be able to make their rapid fire attacks out to the edge of their range. Although, who knows, they could get that from a separate source. That said, the way the rapid fire characteristic has changed is that the rapid fire value, so the rapid fire two number there, is the value that gets added to the number of attacks of the weapon once at half range. This allows the design team to make weapons that, for example, fire four shots at their maximum range, but once they get to half, they fire six or maybe even 10. They could get additional rapid fire attacks over double what they would normally get. It adds another lever to pull with rapid fire weapons, and it means that they read a little bit more easily on the data sheet. You don't, no longer have to do math in your head to double the number of attacks or ask how many extra attacks you get from rapid fire. It just says so on the data sheet. I think this is a great change, and I think it's really interesting. It's similar to DACA weapons from the Orc Codex, which basically functioned exactly like this. And we could kind of see some of the skeleton of 10th edition in these later 9th edition codexes. Now, now, melee weapons have also gotten a little bit of change. Power Fists have lost their minus one to hit. They now have the same weapon skill as their regular weapons. So the Sergeant has a power weapon with four attacks, as we can see. Regular Power Fist equipped models have three attacks, so lower attack value, but hit on threes with the same AP as the power weapon. Power weapons going down a couple points of AP, down to AP2, both on the fist and power weapon variety. Now, the Chain Fist has also lost two points of AP, going from AP4 down to AP2, and retains its minus one to hit, being at a four plus weapon skill, and going from D3 damage to a flat two, which uh, honestly is a little bit unfortunate, but we'll have to see how often damage reduction effects pop up in this edition. In some points of the metagame, damage reduction was all over the place, and a Chain Fist became significantly better than a Power Fist, just for its ability to randomly spike up if you rolled a three on your D3, but it has traded that for the anti-vehicle 3 plus keyword. This means that despite the fact that it's strength 8 and a lot of vehicles are going to be toughness 9 plus, the Chain Fist always wounds any vehicle unit on a 3 plus. That's what the anti-unit ability means. Now they use the terminology critical wound here. These are basically just automatic wounds. Critical wound is a wound that is applied regardless of the toughness of the enemy. So while it does sound like it's, you know, doing a headshot or something, it basically just means that it has what is currently uh, referred to as like a poison ability where you wound on whatever role the ability tells you to against certain unit types. I guess critical wound is technically shorter than saying automatic wounds or saying wounds regardless of the toughness characteristic. I don't know.
Now, honestly, all of these weapon characteristics and weapon changes are really cool, but the most exciting part to me are the special abilities of the Terminator unit. We can see that there are some core and faction abilities being applied. These guys have Oath of Moment, which does something. It apparently targets a unit every turn for some sort of effect, and this might be the Space Marine faction ability. While it's not spelled out in the article, we can kind of glean that from the Fury of the First ability. This one allows the unit to ignore ballistic skill or weapon skill characteristic and hit roll modifiers. So instead of giving them plus one to hit for one CP, like Fury of the First has done in Ninth Edition, it will instead just allow them to shoot through things like effects like dense cover without penalty. In addition, they do get that plus one to hit if they target the unit that you selected with Oats of Moment. We don't exactly know what that means again, but it's something about selecting a unit to be killed, I guess. The Teleport Homer ability allows you to put a Teleport Homer token on the table. This is the little thing that was dropped down in the trailer. And I think basically every Plastic Terminator kit has come with a Teleport Homer token because they've always had some sort of Teleport Homer mechanic. Although clearly this one that comes in this most recent kit is the coolest looking one so far. While the unit is in reserve, this token allows you to target them with the Rapid Ingress Stratagem for zero CP instead of its normal one CP cost. As long as you then accept the restriction of having to place that unit within three inches of of the token. It does say within three and not completely within three, so uh, it does allow you to potentially string out from the token, assuming that measurement is done in the same way in 10th edition as it is in 9th. The assumption is that the way these guys will be entering reserve is the Deep Strike core ability. It has been stated by the design team previously that abilities that are currently colloquially referred to as something by the community, especially based on their existence as a universal special rule in previous editions, will be getting that universal special rule status back. So the assumption that Deep Strike is a reserve that you teleport onto the table nine inches away from enemies or something similar to that is basically guaranteed. Now, the important thing here is exactly what Rapid Ingress does. And this is our first look at the new format for stratagems in the game. And honestly, this is absolutely awesome. The way that the stratagem is laid out is so much more legible than the word salad that the design team was feeding us previously. Now, stratagems have a CP cost near the name. Love it. There is a little icon near the name. I imagine that that means that it is a strategic ploy stratagem, and so that may be referenced by some abilities, such as in the past we've had abilities that reduce the cost of specific categories of stratagems, but again, we just don't know quite yet. However, underneath that, the stratagem specifies the timing of when it is used, the target it can be used upon, the effect that it has, and then any additional restrictions it imposes. And it's so clear. I love it so much. It's like they actually had a rulebook designer come down and read their game and go like, guys, I have some notes for you. This is what you need to do to make your game actually playable. Oh my God, it looks so good. So it, what does this stratagem do? Well, you use it at the end of your opponent's movement phase. When you do, you target a unit from your army that is currently in reserves. What happens when you do that? it can arrive on the battlefield as if it was your reinforcement step. So for basically one CP, you can pay to have a reinforcement step for one unit at the end of your opponent's movement phase instead of the end of your own movement phase. Now, this depends a lot on whether there are additional restrictions on deep strikes and reserve abilities in 10th edition and exactly how those abilities operate. If we were to just to transpose the reserve abilities from 9th edition into 10th edition, this strategy would be absolutely incredible. And I'm kind of hoping that it works this way in 10th edition as well. The reason for that is that a lot of the restrictions imposed on units, especially about moving after they're set up in the battlefield, only affect them for the turn on which they're set up. So what you can do with the stratagem is at the end of your opponent's movement phase, place your reserve unit somewhere that's relatively protected in cover uh, beyond line of sight, but in a still a reasonable striking distance of an objective or your opponent's army. Your opponent has already moved at this point, so they can't then reset up and reshuffle to deal with that teleporting unit. So you should be able to place them pretty comfortably out of your opponent's line of sight, or at least out of reasonable danger. Once their turn is over, it comes back to your turn. You can immediately then move that unit attack and charge with them. So it allows you to set up your units in a position where they could potentially move in closer to enemies than they would normally be able to deep strike in if they were using the normal deep strike rules. Now, the Terminator interaction with the stratagem is pretty interesting because it gives you the cost reduction. It allows you to use it for zero CP, but at the same time, it does restrict you to then teleporting near their teleport homer. But it's important to note that that ability appears to be optional. So you could pay the CP to then teleport them onto the table without using 
they teleport Homer to Rapid Ingress. So you could put the Homer down. Your opponent then has to worry about this Terminator squad dropping down in that area. And then you could juke and jive them and pay the CP to Rapid Ingress during their turn somewhere else on the table. Now, if there are other reactive abilities or reactive stratagems, Rapid Ingress being a core stratagem that is apparently available to every army in the game gets really interesting. If we see a lot more abilities like the Termagant ability to move after enemies move around them, although not necessarily that one since it's unlikely they'll be able to move assuming that the reserve rules stay the same after they're deep struck. But if we see things like Overwatch or Auspex Scan style abilities that allow units to shoot or interrupt the opponent's turn, a stratagem like this to put really annoying units in your opponent's face during their own turn or even deploy screens for your other units out of sequence where your opponent moves up to try to charge you, maybe going for a long bomb charge and you use this stratagem to target a unit that's in deep strike and deploy them in front of the units that they're going to charge makes things really interesting. And I think the amount of play and counterplay that this stratagem makes available to a game of 40k is really interesting. Now, importantly, your unit has to already be in reserves to be targeted by rapid ingress. And we don't quite know yet exactly how units will enter reserve. It is likely that one of the ways to do it will be having the deep strike rule. And I would be shocked if we didn't see some other similar abilities elsewhere in the core rulebook. Things like outflank are ripe for being added to a universal special rule ability. So we could see things like strat... Um, so we could see units like Space Marine Scouts get getting the ability to enter reserve in addition to units that are deep striking with teleporters. Rapid Ingress itself doesn't allow you naturally to enter reserve. You already have to be there. But whether or not there are abilities like strategic reserves in the current version of the game where you can pay CP or even just enter reserve for free with any unit in your army could make the stratagem exceptionally powerful. Now, importantly, it doesn't change exactly where the unit sets up on the table. It only changes when it sets up on the table. So whichever reserve rule you are using to enter reserve will most likely explain to you how to set that unit back up. You're just going to change from doing that in your own reserve step to the reinforcement step of the opponent's turn or after the reinforcement step of the opponent's movement phase. Overall, super cool. And I think the most interesting thing for me here is the new format for stratagems. It looks so good. It's so legible. And if every stratagem in the game is written this way and is as concise as Rapid Ingress, the playability of the game is going to improve monumentally. So also gives us a pretty good look at the interactive and interruptive style of play that they're going for in 10th edition. Again, I just spelled out a bunch of different situations in which you could use a stratagem like a Rapid Ingress, and that's only one stratagem. And anyway, that's all for today, folks. Just a little bit of a short video to talk about some of these really exciting pieces of news that we've gotten from Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Let me know down in the comment section what you think about these changes. Big thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Thanks as well to everybody who supports the channel, either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, YouTube channel members, and Twitch subscribers. All you people are great. I love you. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.